I'm very happy that you accepted the invitation. I have heard your presentation on the API workflow specification in London last September. The room was chock full. There was no standing place left either. So I'm really hoping that we can spread the word because I saw I saw a lot of fantasy in uh, fantasy. I mean, a lot of potential in what you were uh, what you were saying. So I'm thank you very much for for uh, showing it to us here. Delighted to be here. Thanks, Laura. Okay, so welcome everyone. So I'm going to talk to you uh, for the next 20 minutes about something new that we're working on under the Open API initiative called the workflow specification. And I will let you ponder if it really is the missing piece of the API puzzle that can unlock value for both humans and machines when it comes to interacting with APIs. Small warning up front, you're, you're going to see a little bit of YAML uh, here and arguably some bad memes as I progress through the slideware. So a little bit about me. My name is Frankel Commons. I'm Principal API Technical Evangelist at Smartware. I'm a developer and architect by trade with a great passion for APIs and trying my best to improve the, the surrounding developer experience. And I do quite a lot of work with the Open API initiative as well. So the structure of the next 20 minutes or so is I'll take you through the workflow specification and talk about some of the why uh, we started working on this under the Open API initiative umbrella. I'll then take you through the use cases that we focused on as a working group, both the human focused and the AI focused uh, use cases. I'll then give you a whirlwind tour of the workflow specification structure so that you're not, um, let's say, scared about uh, this type of uh, specification. And then hopefully we'll apply it to a quick example where you can see how AI as a co-pilot or an aid for us as API practitioners combined with the workflow specification can hopefully set us in good stead to elevate the consumer API experience. Any time for Q&A at the end or later throughout the day, I'm happy to answer. Now, I'm always surprised when I'm working with companies just how uh, many are struggling within their API programs when it comes to good quality API documentation. And what I always say is if you're building APIs or you're consuming APIs, without any proper documentation, then your house really is on fire. It completely hinders your ability to be able to catalog your API portfolio. That's going to impact the discoverability of APIs. If you can't find APIs, you can't use them. So that's going to hinder adoption. And that could be the making or breaking from a success or failure perspective for your API. And now if you're expecting that you're going to let AI consumers come in and consume your APIs, then I would say find the nearest emergency exit and quick. Now you might say, Frank, you're being a little bit dramatic here. You know, we're aware of good practices for documenting APIs and from a technical reference perspective, we always document our APIs with Open API or Async API or the equivalent industry specification for the style of API that we're delivering. And I would say, great, that's absolutely fundamental, but that's like giving the raw ingredients to the cake baker. It doesn't necessarily tell them the recipe as to how to produce the cake. And what we're actually seeing in the industry and in our own kind of research at Smartware is that there's an alignment gap. Now, these graphs are from our state of software quality for API report from last year. But even though the teams that we surveyed had a good uh, appreciation for what constituted good API documentation, only 48% were confident that their APIs were documented well enough to actually express the business value on offer. Even maybe more surprisingly, 43% were unsure that they had the processes in place to deliver the appropriate consumer developer experience. And that's the same developer experience that they would hold uh, providers of third-party APIs that they were consuming to account when it comes to assessing if they were going to purchase or sign up for a particular API. Now, I think we can all agree here that we do need APIs as we're digitally tra transforming our offerings. And of course, APIs give us that fundamental mechanism to leverage the capabilities that are on offer. But more often when it comes to consuming an API, we need to make more than just a single API call. We actually need to do a sequence of steps to be able to extract some meaningful value from an API and help us get our jobs uh, to be done completed. And so far, we haven't had much help from the specifications community to help us describe that type of complex flow when it comes to dealing with modern API styles. And that's where the workflow specification comes in. So what is it? Well, it's a specification that describes uh, an approach to document use case oriented APIs in a programmatical readable format. And when I talk about a workflow in this context, it's nothing more than a series of API calls which come together to achieve a particular business outcome or objective. 
And the formats that we're dealing with when it comes to this specification is JSON or YAML. So they have sufficiently human readable elements that will, at least through the tooling that will be built up around them, give us the ability to really elevate the story of APIs in a manner that is easy to grok and easy to understand for consumers. And of course, in parallel, the AI and the machines will be quite happy to parse that JSON and YAML instruction. Jumping into the use cases, and when we did set out working on this as a working group, we were initially focusing on the human oriented use cases, both from a provider and a consumer perspective. But naturally, as AI became more sophisticated over the last 12 to 18 months, um, we had many more people coming to us uh, asking if AI use cases were also part of our remit. And the simple answer is yes, of course they are. So we were also processing the use cases with regard to how AI can support us as practitioners, but also how AI can benefit from the, the specification being a fundamental consumer of APIs in 2024. So the first main thing that we focus on is being able to have a deterministic recipe for the use of APIs. And why is that important? Well, if you think if you're handed a complex open API description, like GitHub's, for example, it could have hundreds of endpoints in there. So how do you actually make sense of that unwieldy large reference document? If you're more modular in your approach to delivering API descriptions, then how can you bridge the gap where business flows span more than a single API description? So this is something that's incredibly important for provider teams and consumer teams when it comes to understanding and interacting with APIs. But equally, it's also important for the AI consumer, especially if we are uh, offloading uh, to AI a critical flow or a sensitive flow through the API consumption, we need it to be first time right. And every time right, we can't afford any hallucinations to happen. The next up is living documentation. So I think it was covered by, by some of the previous speakers. API documentation, in, in my mind, is more than just the technical reference documentation. It's also things like concepts, things like tasks and scenarios that can really help us understand what value we can extract from the APIs. And I think we're all also aware of the current uh, situation, especially for API provider teams who maybe don't have dedicated technical writers or a less mature setup, then the likelihood of out-of-band documentation being shared with API consumers is more prevalent. But even if we are creating graphical representations and flows and text data that's going to be embedded within portals, as soon as we do that work, it potentially will become stale and out of sync with the actual API design and implementation. So we really wanted to give a mechanism to be able to keep this documentation more living and always in sync with the, with the actual APIs themselves. Again, something that's incredibly important for the A I consumer as well. More on the human-centered side, then we also wanted to improve the ecosystem around code generation and SDK generation. Because again, if you're dealing with a very large unwieldy API document, then the code that gets generated from that is going to be equally large and unwieldy. And you're going to get a lot of boilerplate noise that you're not necessarily interested in. But by generating an SDK or code off a specific use case oriented workflows document, you will have a very focused uh, SDK that will keep the consumer on piste and focused on extracting the value as quickly as possible. And they won't be distracted by any endpoints that are not uh, relevant. Thinking then about how can we assert the business value that we're promising to our API consumers. So as we're making changes under the hood to the different microservices or APIs, can we still assert that the actual business value that we're exposing outside of our organization or outside of our domain is still assertable? And this is incredibly important for the humans engaged, but it's also important for AI, who's been, again, uh, tasked with the responsibility of making sure that that value is still assertable. Thinking then from a production standpoint, so when, the, when we deploy the API to an environment and it's being consumed, how are we sure that the production consumption is actually meeting the expectations of the consumer flows that we anticipate? So again, the workflow specification is targeted at allowing us to be able to validate the consumption patterns against well-known uh, expected usage flows and alert us and warn if that is not um, happening. And that's incredibly useful from a security perspective. So if you think of one of the new OWASP top 10 security risks for uh, um, unrestricted access to business flows, then the workflows document give us a way to allow machines and AI to observe the consumption patterns and alert us if something is going wrong. It's also interesting from a regulatory perspective. So open banking um, 
in the UK are interested at looking at the workflow specification to assert if providers are exposing the capabilities that they're required by regulation to provide. And then last but not least, uh, we also wanted to ensure interoperability and resilience for those working with APIs. So we wanted to make sure that they have a way to describe these scenarios, describe these use cases in a manner that's not uh, tooling specific or vendor specific. So there are some niche implementations out there where different tooling will give folks the ability to craft some of these recipes or workflows. But again, that's kind of locking teams in and we want to do so in a very industry agnostic manner. And again, that can really help us also as we start making APIs available for the LLMs. Again, we want to do so in a way that's interoperable and it's not specifically focused on a particular um, LLM model or implementation by any particular company because that will uh, break interoperability and when it will also introduce an anti-pattern that we're trying to uh, mitigate against and that's back in for LLM. So what we're actually seeing is loads of people are now stuffing semantics specifically into uh, API designs to allow them to work better with a particular LLM but again, every time they want to make that available for a new model, they have to stuff in more semantics. And that is also gonna make it very, very hard for humans to consume those same artifacts. So again, we want to try to negate and nip this particular anti-pattern in the bud before it becomes too prevalent. And I think the theme that you would have heard today when it comes um, to how AI uh, will work with humans, I think this cartoon is apt on, on so many levels, but you might be familiar with uh, some research um, called the Big Bench experiment that uh, was carried out about 18 months ago, where uh, 450 AI researchers put together over 200 uh, workflows that the different LLMs were kind of put through their paces. And they um, described or uh, documented on what they call emergent abilities. So when they scaled the AI models to a sufficient level of resources, it just developed uh, skills and capabilities that weren't there before. Um, personally, I agree with some counter research that has come out uh, recently from uh, Stanford uh, University pointing to emerging capabilities being nothing more than the researcher's choice and what metrics to measure rather than they being any fundamental property of a model. And the improvements that we're seeing are very predictable and actually not magically emergent. So I think that's quite reassuring with regards to how we will interact with AI. And I think we all need to be more diligent to ensure we don't misclassify the role of AI within our professions. And I like um, very much classifying it as a productivity tool that will help me, but we still need human expertise to qualify and assert if the actual value or the output that's been spat out is as we would expect and is actually correct and not um, containing different hallucinations. And if we think about this specifically from an AI consumption perspective, and if we're realizing that AI is now also an API consumer, it's gonna face exactly the same challenges that humans do when it comes to trying to consume poorly documented or undocumented APIs. And the workflow specifications will play a crucial role in giving enough semantic instruction to ensure that AI can actually chain API calls together in a way that, as I mentioned earlier, is first time right and every time right. And then when we think of AI as our companion or as our aid to help us be more pro productive, hopefully, then we can also leverage the workflow specification as being the glue that will allow us to kind of fast track our ability to produce an experience for API consumers, and that's human consumers, um, in a manner that will allow them to extract the value from the APIs on offer as quickly as possible. So what does the workflow specification look like? Well, if you're familiar with Open API or Async API as specifications, hopefully this picture is slightly familiar to you. So this just represents all of the objects that are part of the specification. And here's a very quick uh, description of all of these objects, but I, I don't have time to get into that uh, today, but I'm happy to share links to other talks where I deep dive into all of these. And you will be, um, I suppose, grateful to know that it's not a complex specification. It's quite easy to understand. So let's run through a very quick example as to how this could add some value for us. <clears throat> so let's assume that we're working for a company called Petco and we have a problem that we have to solve. So unfortunately, we're being overwhelmed by the number of pets being abandoned in our pet store. We've done our industry uh, research and we've decided that we're gonna create an ability to 
uh, search for and adopt pets that we catalog through our own website. But we're going to also make it available as an API product uh, to a broader ecosystem of pet shelters uh, and charities and so forth. So what does that mean? Well, it means we build two APIs within our company, a pets API and an adoptions API. These could even be delivered by different teams, so completely independent APIs. But the workflow that we want to make available to our UX team and also to that and broader ecosystem of API consumers is the ability to be able to adopt a pet matching specific criteria. So there's a number of steps involved. So we need to be able to search for a pet, initiate an adoption request, confirm that adoption by updating the status and verifying that the pet actually has been adopted and is no longer a part of the available pets list. Now, the workflow specification gives us very rich semantic mechanisms to describe exactly how to achieve this workflow. So there'll be no more guessing as to what combination of endpoints we need to uh, put together. And if we look at the specification, that will allow us to represent in YAML this very deterministic workflow. But again, as I mentioned at the outset, this might be perfectly good for AI, and it is actually perfectly good for AI to be able to get this API workflow done every time right. But for humans, you may all not enjoy parsing YAML quite as much as I do. So the real affordance will be when tooling will be built up around the specification to turn this into living documentation. So then this type of YAML can actually generate more human palatable information that will allow me as an API consumer to fully understand what I need to do to embed this particular uh, workflow into my own system. And just for the fun, for uh, this conference, I've put together a little GPT to, and I trained it on uh, the workflow specification to see how it would act as a, as a support to me working with the specification to generate consumer uh, API documentation. So I'm just testing it out here on, a, on the specification itself. And then what I do is I give it the URLs to those two API endpoints and I tell it the, the tasks that it needs to be able to describe in the workflow, some additional instruction just to keep it on piece. And it does a pretty good job at generating a workflows and document conforming to the actual workflows specification. Of course, as a human, I challenge it a little bit more because I would never fully trust AI to get it right for me. So I challenge it a little bit, direct it, and in the second pass, it does a pretty good job at creating the um, workflows document that it would want. So I take that as my 80% done document, and then I uh, tweak it a little bit more, and then I pass that back into uh, the GPT, and I say, now generate me some um, getting started guides with the spe specific instruction template that it has. So it generates some markdown tables, breaking down all of the tasks, and it generates some um, graphs representing the actual workflow. And if we look at how that would look like in a developer portal, it doesn't matter what developer portal, this just happens to be Sw um, Swagger Hub's portal, but it could be any developer portal. I have an adopt pet product. If I jump into that, I have my pets API, I have my adoptions API, and then this is the getting started guide that I was able to uh, quickly generate and uh, leveraging the GPT that had been trained on the workflow specification. So it gives me a summary of what um, the wor workflow is all about. I also have asked it to just generate some metadata about the workflow itself. It breaks down all of the steps into an easy to kind of process table with the step IDs, the descriptions, the operation and the APIs that's going to be responsible for that, the parameters I need to pass, what determines if it's successful and what outputs will be returned by that step and made available for the next steps. I also asked it, as, as you saw, to generate some graphical representations of the workflows. So you can do that in different um, formats and then offset that and pass it into a tool that can generate the rendered version of it for you. I took it a little bit further then and also asked it to generate some client code for me and um, representing the workflow. So again, this is just not an A to Z listing of uh, client code. This is a client code to actually execute that business outcome of adopting a pet. And it did a pretty decent job at uh, creating a TypeScript um, client, uh, which went through the steps of searching for available pets and uh, getting the first uh, pet matching that criteria, initiating the adoption request and updating the pet status, confirming that the pet status then had been set to adopt it and doing all of the, the methods underlying. So this is just a sneak peek 
as to the potential that the spe specification combined with AI can also do on the flip side of us producing better human-centered API documentation, which is one of the, the situations that I'm um, very excited about. Just gonna go back to the slides. So what is the status of the specification? Well, the implementer draft is ready for launch. So we're updating the OpenAPI's website and we're launching the new specification uh, any day now, really is that close. We are going to do a bit of a marketing exercise to come up with a more catchy name than just the workflow specification. So stay tuned for that. What I really would love is everyone here, if you do see value in this type of specification for different um, aspects across the API landscape, then your call to action would be to join the OpenAPI uh, workspace, start the repo, share it with your colleagues, share it with your network. And I'd love it for you to submit your use cases so that we can build up a good example repository of real world workflows that help people get their jobs done. If you do want to learn more, here's the links to the GitHub repositories. As I said, this is all happening uh, under the Open API initiative, which is part of the Linux Foundation. So it's all open source, it's all vendor neutral, and hopefully you will be seeing a rich uh, ecosystem of tooling being built up around the specification in 2024. So thanks very much. If you do have any questions, feel free to ask or feel free to, to reach out to me and I'll be around the lounge uh, later today as well. Frank, thank you very, very much. Um, and you for um, the question that I wanted to ask what kind of contributions you're looking for so uh, there people can find it. Would you be willing to uh, still repeat some of those uh, links uh, in, yes. in the chat? Thank yes, you. Yes, of course, yeah. And you have one, two questions, sorry. Uh, would users want to generate their own use cases on the fly using API? Um, I think so. I think as, as providers, I think generally you will have a good um, opinion on what use cases you want to offer. But, but the beauty about APIs in general um, is that they're composable. So others can then start composing different APIs and pulling them together to help them achieve the particular use case that they are interested in, which might even span more than a single API provider. And um, so the workflow specification also allows people to craft those things on the fly. So it will add kind of like Lego building blocks, lots of mechanisms for us to assemble API products and value propositions much, much quicker and having a richer uh, ecosystem of value focused uh, API products. So this is uh, one of the things I like about this specification is it has lots of different perspectives and layers that will bring value to APIs, both on the technical aspect, but I'm also particularly interested in the affordances that it will bring in helping consumers um, achieve their jobs to be done as quickly as possible. At the risk of sounding really stupid, I have this wild idea that we're gonna, we might soon come full circle where instead of requesting a single key as access, you're going to request approval of your use case from yes. business to business. Yes, I, I, I would think so. And, and and even there's interest in that from a, from a regulatory perspective as well. Um, and I think I mentioned it very, very briefly, but um, open banking is one of the, the industries that want to define uh, the, the, the regulatory workflows that they expect to be honored by the different um, financial providers, but you can imagine um, that that would even go further and there could be a, a marketplace of um, workflows or scenarios that you want to make available to, to the different consumers. Um, and that's, for me, that's more natural as to how people will want to search for APIs. So you will have a particular problem or a particular use case that you're trying to solve. And if you're able to and browse and see what um, what published workflows are out there supporting that particular use case. It's a more intuitive way for you also to to help um, discover and locate those things rather than searching for a specific API document, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, it, it's it's in a way that is um, semantically understandable for for the machines. And <clears throat> Chris in the last talk was was talking about how we can make the documentation 
more more findable for LLMs and, and even SEO, but I think even thinking about the workflows. So I can imagine that we'll have workflow registries that are popping up, and then that will be very, very easy for the machines to, to hook into, classify and, and uh, catalog those things and surface them as people are um, trying to scratch a particular itch uh, or solve a problem that they have. Uh, then it will be surfacing these workflows to them and then they'll be able to understand okay well what apis and what providers under the hood are, are offering these capabilities and make a um make a decision on on the procurement of those things in a way that makes sense for business stakeholders mm -hmm. which i think is also interesting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as soon as we start talking about apis in those c-level meetings if we're looking for for procurement uh, dollars it becomes a technical discussion, but if we can talk about, okay, these are the use cases and the scenarios and the outcomes that we will achieve by procuring this particular um, capability, it's it's much, much easier to have that conversation with the with the buyer persona that's that's in your org as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very, very much.